This podcast is brought to you by Contessa Digital. everyone welcome to confidently cherished i'm keisha rice and you know i am a dating coach for ambitious women of faith who are looking to have healthy relationships by healing their unhealthy relationship patterns and you're in for a treat because we have twice the dating and relationship coaches today <laughs> so selena i'm gonna let you introduce yourself and tell everyone what you do Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Selena Almodovar. I am a Christian relationship author and coach. I'm a four-time publisher. Uh, and I, in a nutshell, my mission in life is to get women and couples to a place that fits God's mold of relationships. What does that mean? That means according to the word, they are standing before each other. They are naked and unashamed, which is described as Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden in the book of Genesis. And so it's my motive. It's my mission to get everyone to a place where they can establish a relationship that's fulfilling, that's faith filling and allows them to be naked and unashamed in front of their partner. So I really wanted to have you on because you and I have a lot in common Yeah. Um, between you and I both identify as Christian and, you know, I study religion in college. So I know that my coaching is a little bit more broad than yours because I work with women of all faith, but at the same time, that is something that's really important to me. I have to work with a woman who has some faith and you talk about specifically being a Christian coach you know, there's so much nowadays in social media, internet in general, about hookup culture and, you know, doing things a, a certain way. And I will not name her, but I was watching a certain um, relationship coach on TikTok earlier today. And, you know, she was talking about like how to hustle men and, and, and get money and all that good stuff. Why do you think incorporating faith into the dating and relationship process is so important? Oh, I believe it's so important because there is one model. There is one blueprint of love. You know, God is the creator of love. And if you're trying to do it a different way, if you're trying to use another teacher to teach you how to do something that they did not create themselves, then there's always going to be a confusion or a dead end or a mix up or a hang up, but there's always going to be a missing piece. There's always going to be a void. And so there are lots of versions of what people think love is and what relationships is. But for me, what worked for me, and I can only speak about me and my testimony, what worked for me is going to the source and really understanding, you know, what is God's love? for me to me and what is that relationship that I have in my faith with God and that should be the blueprint that I model everything else as you know and so I think a lot of people get fearful or intimidated by that because a they've had a bad uh, experience with religion they've had a bad experience with faith um, b they get very intimidated of God because they see God as this all powerful, angry, um, persona that just cannot be reached. They don't understand the personal relationship concept and see, um, everybody thinks that it's easier and funner and more liberating to do it in, in a space that doesn't uh, have so many rules, I would say, that don't have as many boundaries. If they could just be free to do whatever they want, then they think that they'll reach that that level of pleasure and fulfillment that they're trying to reach. But from my understanding of it is, you know, there are things in place, there are the guardrails in place, there are um, certain roads that you should take according to the blueprint, according to how God designed love and relationships and all of that to really get the best out of the best. And so that's why I think people kind of go rogue. And that's why I think uh, 
looking to faith, looking at the creation and the creator of love is probably the best way to go to get the best fulfilling thing that you're trying to create in your love life. Yeah. So see, I can already tell we're going to have a bunch of things to, to talk about because what you said about boundaries, I want to come back to that. Yes. But <laughs> again, in, in my case, I probably have 80% of my clients are Christian and the other 20% yeah. are women of other faiths. So they're Jewish, Muslim, okay. you know, yeah. and regardless, I, I always tell them that self-love is, is so important because oftentimes when I am meeting with women, I run into women who have this idea that in theory, God can do anything, right? But yeah. because they are so this, they've made all of these mistakes, God doesn't want to do anything for them or he you know, won't do yeah. anything for them. So how do you talk to your clients about self-love and understanding how out of all of our relate all of our relationships, including our faith-based relationship, including our relationship with God, flows out of self-love. I believe that if you it's it's so interesting because my mind is going everywhere right now. I, I've read an audiobook that can speak to this that I just finished today. And it was a novel, it was a rom-com novel. You know, I like to listen to light reading in the summertime. And uh, one of the things that they talked about is people don't like themselves. And because they don't like themselves, they fear that everyone else is going to feel the same way. And they don't see what other people see in them. And I think that really speaks to your point is that, you know, if you don't have self-love in yourself, then nobody can give you the uh, insurance. Nobody can persuade you if you can't persuade yourself, you know? And even if you think that, oh, this person loves me, so therefore it must be true, then now you're, you're facing a, a relationship where you're fully dependent on something else and you're never gonna be grounded. You're always gonna be shaky. Your foundation is always going to be weak. So it has to come from you. It has to start with you. And um, I think- if you don't understand that, then everything is going to fall apart. But then at the, at the same time, you have a lot of women out there who are very strong and who are very independent and who have a great deal of love for themselves in different areas, you know, but when it comes to relationships, when it comes to their heart, you know, the thing that they're most vulnerable with, they all of a sudden get very insecure about it, especially if they've been burned in the past, if they've been hurt in the past. And so to those women, what I say is you have to give yourself grace because nobody on this earth is perfect and we are all evolving. We are all growing. We all make mistakes. And so to carry on to a shame or a guilt of what happened in the past because you were hurt or because someone you know, mistook your vulnerability for weakness or for something that never grew into what you wanted it to grow in. I think that that is going to really cast a bad light with the relationships that you have moving forward. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, that kind of leads us back into boundaries because yeah. don't get me wrong. There are terrible people out there. Yeah. There are people who will take advantage. Um, and that's just a matter of life. We deal with that. We live and we learn. At the same time, you know, one of the ways that we at least lessen the chances of that happening is by having strong boundaries and by setting our standards high. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, with clients, I have to remind them of this because there's this whole idea, well, like if I set these standards, if I set these boundaries, mm -hmm. men aren't going to be interested in me and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to have as many options. And to an extent, that's the point, right? Like you need mm -hmm. to be weeding out the ones who aren't meant for you. You have to understand that, you know, as you know, in Christian circles, we talk about it all the time. Rejection is protection sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk with your clients about, you know, using their discernment and setting their boundaries and incorporating their faith into their boundaries, like what are some of the boundaries that you really want them to have in place before they go 
out into the world trying to form these relationships? It really just depends on the person because you can have someone who is very young who thinks that they know what love is when really they don't. They're just still maturing and growing. You know, I remember in high school, I thought I was ready to get married and that was high school. You know, I was very underdeveloped emotionally and uh, my maturity was very weak. And then you have women who have had long-term marriages and relationships who finally get out of it who finally feel like, okay, I know what it's like to have a partner every day, but now I don't, and I'm struggling. And I feel like in order to feel complete, I need that companionship again. And so they feel like they're ready to go out there. I think at the end of the day, the boundaries have to come between what do you want for your best self, you know, and in order to establish what those boundaries are, you have to, you have to first answer that. What do you want for your best self? self, what is going to make you feel peace, joy, love, security first. So to answer the question, I guess one of the things that I tell my clients and I tell the women that I work with is before you go looking for a man, you have to rediscover yourself. You have to redesign what love looks like to you and what it feels like to you. And part of that is determining those values, like what really matters to you, what's really important to you at the end of the day, because someone who has a six figure job might not be so hot on your scale. You know, you might not care if they have a six figure job. You just care that they're hardworking and they go to work and they, they have a mean, they're passionate about something. Whereas the well, other might person, make six figures and be terrible with money, which it, in case it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, right. And, and then you have, then you have the opposite spectrum where you have a woman who's like, absolutely not. I make six figures. I have all of these degrees. I'm the CEO. So therefore I'm not going to date anyone beneath that status. You know, it all depends on your values. And I think once you determine that, then it's so much easier to figure out the boundaries of what you can and cannot do for yourself. Because at the end of the day, we set boundaries in every aspect of our life. You know, if you want a job, you know, you're not just going to go get any job. You're not going to go and go to become a barista at a coffee shop when you're like, no, I need this many figures and I need to earn this much money. You know, we, we're setting a boundary in our job, right? Or if you're working out, you're setting a boundary. I'm going to stop working out when I feel like this, or I'm when I reach a certain goal, like this is my boundary. So we do it everywhere else. I think it's just so hard for us to do it with relationships because again, our heart is involved in it and we get very vulnerable with our heart and we're very, very overprotective of that heart. But in order to really fill and nurture your heart, you have to figure out what's important to you first. And then once you figure out those values, then it's like, it, it becomes easier to say yes and no to the boundaries. It becomes easier to set the stakes and to say, no, this guy does not believe in God. I think that God is a very high value in my life. So that's the bar. That's my boundary. I'm going to say no. You know, it's, it just becomes easier once you understand yourself and what you need, what your heart needs. Yeah. You know, it's funny you said that because my mom and I constantly joke about CMEs. So that is people who go to church on Christmas, Mother's Day, yes. Easter. Um, and I bring it up because, you know, one of the things that I tell all of my clients is that we live in a society where faith has become a spectrum. So if, you know, you are, you know, if you're on a dating app or you're meeting someone out in person and you say you're Christian, that person could be Christian as in they're at church every time the doors open until it closes, or they could be Christian as in um, they grew up going to a Christian church and now they go to the church once a year. Um, like there, there's yes. this full spectrum. And a lot of times I find that women will say at the beginning, you know, when they're first starting to date someone, especially, you know, he's good looking, they're infatuated. It doesn't matter. But then when you start thinking about if the two of you plan on having children, how those children mm-hmm. are going to be raised. Mm-hmm. If you start thinking about 
you know, if you are really into your faith and there's a lot of like religious holidays or your church has a lot of religious events and that's a big part of your social life, like yes. how is that going to impact things? So what is your experience with that? Do you feel like the women you work with before they come to you, like, are they having enough of these discussions about like, hey, this is how this actually plays out in my everyday life? No, they're not. Mm -hmm. um, unequally yoked also can be within the Christian world. And you hit the nail on the head. There are women out there who are looking for, quote unquote, the man of God, the man on fire for God, the man after God's own heart. But then the minute they go on that date and say, this guy says, oh, I believe in God. Oh, I was raised a Christian. That's enough for them. Like, that's like, oh, that's it. But then, as you said, they get deeper into the relationship. They get closer to this person and they realize that what they meant is not what they're seeing or vice versa. And it's an unequal yoke. It's an unequal yoke. You, you might believe in the same thing for, you know, when you, when you die and you, you go to heaven or wherever, but that is that enough for you? You know? So when I first started dating as an adult, a young adult, all I had to hear was, Oh, you're Christian. Oh, perfect. You ch check the box. You're done. You're great. But then something radically happened to me during my grad school years. I went to church and I found a church and I developed a fire for the Lord. I, I rededicated my life and I, I had this spiritual fire, this awakening in me. And I wanted my boyfriend to come with me because he checked the box. He's a Christian. He should be equally as excited. He was not. It felt like dragging teeth. It, it was like pulling teeth and dragging him every single Sunday to go to this church. And I thought, well, okay, at least he'll be there on Sundays when we have kids. But I'm looking at the qualities now. We're two young people. This is how it is. Like, how do I expect it to change once more is added? You know, and so as I got older, I said, well, I want a man on fire for God, you know, so now I'm looking at it from a different perspective, a different lens. And so now I'm seeing men who are totally on fire for God, want to go missionary, grow their hair out, sell all their belongings, do all of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, uh, that's a lot, you know, not saying it's bad. I just don't know if I'm there. Um, I guess I will be if I got a fast, but I don't think this is where God is leading me. So you have to find somebody who's running at your pace, you know, and that goes with spirituality as well. Are you, is it valuable to you that the person that you are looking for in terms of faith is an all in Christian doing everything that they need to be? Is that what's what attracting you or is your faith still at a pace where you just want to get to church every Sunday and you just want to try to grow your faith? And is the person meeting more along the lines of that pace? You know, I think if you try to go too slow or too fast, then there's going to be a disconnect. There's going to be an unequal balance. And the same goes with women who are like, I am on fire for God and I will help him get on fire with me. There's a lot of women who think that we can dating minister for potential. to <laughs> right. They're dating for potential. They can minister to their mans and they could think, well, as the closer he gets to me, the closer he'll see God. And then that's going to radically change him. You can't be the Holy spirit for these people. And you can't bring these people, um, to a faster pace if they're not willing to put a pop in their step, you know? So I think it's very important. And yes, to answer your question, a lot of women fail to really address it and to have that conversation with the person that they're interested in. They just assume, and then they don't want to push any buttons. They don't want to offend anyone. And so they just assume that it is what it is and they'll figure it out as they go. And unfortunately the figuring out turns into nothing. Yeah. And, you know, I want to add that if you have things that are important to you, please do not assume, ask the yes. question, because as you were talking, I thought of an experience I had when I was single, I was dating this guy and, you know, so I grew up Pentecostal. So, you know, mm -hmm. very, very conservative. And yeah. I also come from a family of ministers. So I have, my dad is a preacher. My brother is aunts, uncles, and I want to emphasize aunts there. Yeah. Um, and I say that because this guy, he and I, it was kind of those things where we kind of one of those things where we're in the same like church circles. So yeah. like we knew we had known each other for years before we became friends and started dating 
and he knew my family. He knew the female preachers in my family. And after dating for a little bit, I found out that he didn't believe in women preachers. And I was like, okay. huh? yeah. right. Say what now? <laughs> yeah. What? Because again, he had known my family, including the women in my family. You know, my great grandmother was like the first female evangelist at her church. Um, so he had known about this. And I was like, well, obviously, if he knows, he's he's cool with that. And then again, it was months down the road of us dating that I found out that he was not okay with women preachers. And I was like, that is going to be a huge problem. Yeah. So um, what, what does me. that mean for us? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so yeah, don't, don't assume, like seriously ask the questions um, when it comes to setting those standards and knowing what it is that you need. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, talking about growing up as a church girl, you talked about, you know, dating younger and, and thinking that you knew what you wanted. And, and sometimes I say that prayer, you know, thank God that I did not end up with this man yes. or that man because I would be <laughs> yeah. divorced by now um yes and you know so so in my case I was in my late 20s when I got married mm -hmm. um and you know I have I have clients of all ages that come to me but I, I occasionally get the client who is like 21 22 and she's telling me that she thinks that her life is over because she has friends who are getting married and because she's not married obviously she's going to be alone forever Mm -hmm. And first of all, you know, my personal opinion, I feel like my life started at 30. Not mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> not, right. But, 20s are the new teens <laughs> and 30s beyond, are the new 20s. Yeah. But beyond that, I feel like, let me know if you agree with me on this, but I feel like one of the reasons why we exist as coaches is because churches themselves aren't doing enough to really equip young women with what they need to know about relationships to help them give a realistic idea of what relationships should look like. And, and also even just this whole idea of, you know, the Bible talks about to everything, there's a season in, in Ecclesiastes mm -hmm. and just this whole acceptance that for some of us, our single season is going to last into his thirties, maybe even forties, or, you know, yeah. maybe even beyond that. Um, for, for some women, their single season is much shorter, but it's not about, it's not about the years. It's about the quality, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I get that. I, I get it all the time. You know, why, what is wrong with me? Why isn't happening yet? And I always just kind of tell them, I've been in business for 10 years and I'm no Joyce Myers, <laughs> you know, I'm, I still wait in certain areas of my life thinking, when is the breakthrough coming, you know, or you, you got to think about the mother or the other wife who's been married and still doesn't have children. They're in a season of waiting in their life. You know, you think about all of the people who are going through their own waiting season and it's tough for everybody and everybody's going through the same struggle. It's the weight and it's the breakthrough and it's the mind boggling, uh, question that wrestling with God that I'm praying enough and I'm waiting enough and I'm being happy and I'm being content and God just talk to me. God just, you know, when is it going to happen? When is going to happen? We all struggle through that. I think for women, they feel like their life is passing them by and, I, I feel that way because there's so much when they reach that late teen, you know, they finish, they finish college or they finish high school and there's this transition of ending and this, this season of something should be beginning, you know, and I'm at the end of this. I did everything that everybody told me to do. So naturally, according to the world and its standards and our culture, naturally this is the next step and so they feel stuck they feel like they're in this limbo and you're right i think churches i think ministries i think young adult groups everywhere they should be nurturing these people and telling them like this is a new season but it doesn't always go in the way that society is telling you it should go in and we have to be we have to do a better job of encouraging people of 
when there is an end of a transition, when there is their end of a season, um, how you feel and our expectations need to be different. It needs to be less entitled, if I can say that. Yeah. And it needs to be, and it needs to be more open to just receiving what will be, what is, you know, I think if we focus less on, I get the prints at the end of the movie and they all live happily ever after. And we focus more on, there is a vast new world out there and there's going to be a lot of adventures that doesn't always come in the form of a man, but perhaps of a job or a travel or a friendship or something else that's going to happen in your journey in this space. And we have to prepare our eyes and our mind and our heart for that, whatever that is, then I think it would be a little less damaging when people don't get what they want when they want it, you know? Who said that getting married had to be the next step after college? Who said that getting married and starting a family had to be the next step once you turn 25? And who said that life does not continue or you are worth less because those things don't happen in that timeline, you know? So we have to do better with taking what the culture and what our world has given us. And we have to tell people like, this is the truth. This is what's real. This is the lie. This is what they want you to believe. This is what really is. And this is what we should be okay with. We should be okay with the present, the everyday manna, the manna that God gives us lasts for that one day, you know, except for the Sabbath, which whole nother story, but he gives us enough for one day. Why can't today be enough for you? You know, he gives us enough for that day, enough for that season. Why can't we embrace what is here? Why do we continuously long and feel short because we do not have what we're supposed to have? And if you really believe in God, if you really put your faith to the test, you know, everything is perfect timing, God's perfect timing. And when you finally get the man, you're finally going to be like, man, that was perfect timing. That is, I just love that. That is perfect timing. Lord, you are so perfect. You're going to be like, oh, really? Because. 22 years, you know, you were, you were saying it wasn't perfect timing, but it always comes together in the end. I think we just have to do a better job of, um, appreciating the present. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, I feel like this is a, this is a dirty little secret that like particularly good Christian women don't talk about. Um, but I know a lot of unhappily married women, right? Yes. (laughs) Um, yes. And the idea of a single season, to your point, looks different for for all of us. Some people have longer single seasons. Some of us have shorter single seasons. But I know that I thoroughly enjoyed my single season, right? Like in that time, I got two degrees. Um, I traveled the world. I did all these different things. I cultivated some really great friendships that are now a great support system to me as a married woman, because, you know, you should not put everything on one person to be your everything. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think we don't give enough credit and do to this idea that first of all, every previous season is preparation for the next. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you want to be a good wife, your single season is preparation for wife season but also mm-hmm. understanding that that season is fulfilling in itself and yes. really learning how to appreciate it. And to contrast that, I wish I've been married for 10 years now. I have a great marriage, three kids, all that, but I wish I could go back and redo my single season. There are so many regrets that I have. And of course God used it all, you know, um, going through the bad relationships, getting my heart broken, hitting rock bottom emotionally led me to this point today, talking to you about what you should do. Right. But if I had the chance to go back, I would have traveled the world. I would have had my own apartment, you know, the cute apartment in the city. I would have, you know, devoted more attention and time on building better friendships in my life. I would have discovered more of what I liked and who I was, as opposed to feeling like I needed to fill my void with men. I was boy crazy. And so every time I broke up with someone, I immediately was like, okay, well, let me go to the club. Let me go to the bar. Let me start flirting with this guy. You know, I immediately tried to fill it 
with another guy. And now that I've been married and now that I don't have the single season, I don't have time to myself. I don't get to do those things on my own anymore because I have to consider my marriage. I have to consider my family. I, I wish I could. And a lot of people fail to see that because their eyes and their eyes is set on the wrong prize. And what you said, doing whatever you want, going to travel, educating yourself, strengthening yourself, deepening yourself brings a better person in you so that yes, when you become the wife that you are called to be, then you are an, a phenomenal wife. You are an exceptional wife. You are the wife that this man has been praying for because they know themselves, they're mature, they're grounded, you know, their faith is there. They, they have aspired and they dreamed and they know how to go after that. And so they're going to take that gift that they learned and they're going to pursue it in their marriage. So now God's going to use them together to go after something, you know, because now you know what it's like to be on that adventure. Now, you know what it's like to step out in faith. Now, you know what it's like to, to do those things that you did in your single season. And a lot of people just, they don't look at it that way. And if I could go back now that I see, I would, I would look at it differently. When we think about identity so often, those of us who, who grew up in conservative households, end yeah. up, your identity is church girl. You know, I grew up in the church. I'm a pew baby. Part of me will always be church girl. Right. Yeah. But in my marriage with my husband, like, yes, we do talk about the Bible and, and yes, we do pray together and all that. But that is not what we spend 24 hours a day doing. I don't wake up next to my husband in the morning and like, as soon as he opens his eyes, I say, praise the Lord, right? <laughs> yeah. When you hear scriptures about like, you know, your identity being in God and you being a child of God and all that, you know, call me crazy. But I think that, God created this great big world so that part of our identity could be exploring it and, and learning it and appreciating all the things that it has to offer. And I think we do a disservice to ourselves, but also we do disservice to our spouses and to our children when we don't allow all the facets of ourselves to develop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I believe that everyone has a calling everyone has a purpose and sometimes that calling and that purpose leads you to a church of only a hundred people and that's all you're called to do and you find fulfillment in that but it's like what you said knowing that that's what's going to bring you the joy knowing that that's what's going to bring you the pleasure that is the important part if you're doing it just because your family did it and you are expected to do it, but you find no fulfillment in that, you know, you're called for something greater Then, yeah, you're doing yourself and everyone after you a disservice. Knowing who you are is going to help you not only get closer to what God wants you to become and where God wants to lead you, but it's also going to pave the way so that everyone else who follows you or is inspired by you can be called to do the same. And so therefore we're all creating a massive movement of this truth seeking and this joy filling and this passion pursuing kind of thing. So one of the things that I want to ask you about going from dating to married life, because yeah. you have a few years on me, I've been married for four years. So, okay. so you've been married a little bit longer than I have. Um, there is so much, I alluded to it earlier, talk about unhappiness in marriage and I see women complaining about you know in the dating stage maybe they didn't set certain boundaries and then things continued yeah. and now they're in the marriage and they're unhappy yeah. um I see women talking about how you know I never knew who I was before I got married and then I just kind of fell into this I I see women complain about feeling like their identity was taken from them um yes. i was reading a a reddit post where this woman was complaining about her in-laws because she said that ever since she became a mother they always refer to her now as mommy they don't say her name anymore mm. she's like i just i just want someone to say my first name um 
And, and it's not just my children calling me mommy. It's, it's now my mother-in-law saying, oh, uh, you know, saying to, the, to their grandchild, oh, mommy wants you to do this. And uh, how are you feeling mommy instead of how are you feeling Susan, Jessica, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so how do you think, what do you think women need to do once they enter that season of being married to make sure that they keep their identity, that they don't lose themselves? And it's important to have a union, right? But, yeah. you know, you have this union between you and your spouse, but you also are still you, right? Yeah. I, I see that audiobook I was telling you about that novel, I heard something and I was like, let me stop and let me write this down. And I, I was like, I don't know if this is going to be a TikTok or what, but I feel like I need to share this, um, for this, for this exact answer. And while I pull it up, it's in my notes section. While I pull it up, the long story is long story short. There's a lot of wives who are hiding in their marriage. There's a lot of wives who are hiding in their marriage and they are hiding in plain sight because they feel like they don't have a voice. They feel like they are not going to be heard. They feel like being married is going to mask every problem and any problem that they have. And they feel like as long as I show up and, and pretend that I'm this happy wife because wives are supposed to be happy because they have the man and what more do you want? Then everything will be well. So hold on. It says here, I wrote a whole paragraph. Um, you cover up the truth of your conditions, hoping that the remain that the reminder of having a fun time and having a fun marriage is going to wash away all of the built up stuff that you have inside of yourself, but it's not, it's, it's not going to change any, nothing is going to change until you find the courage, the boldness, the bravery to come out of hiding. Okay. And until you're honest with yourself about how you feel about what's right and what's wrong about what you desire, you know, to, to answer the woman in the Reddit, why doesn't she just say, Hey, I don't like to be called that way. It makes me feel this way. Can you please do this until you come out and exercise your voice and stand your presence? I feel like a lot of women, um, they feel like they're not allowed to take up space in their marriage. They don't want to be, uh, difficult or challenging, but as long as you keep hiding in that, you're never going to be okay. And it's, what's going on is never going to improve itself until you face it head on. A lot of women are afraid of confrontation. They're afraid of communicating. And again, there, it goes back to that vulnerable heart. They don't want to break it. They don't want to be transparent and completely reveal themselves, AKA be completely naked, right? As according to that Genesis verse I mentioned earlier, and they don't want to expose themselves for what they're thinking, what they're feeling and how they're unhappy. And so for these people, communication can go a long way, but in order to communicate the hard stuff, you got to be bold and you got to be courageous in that. And the only way you're going to develop those two things is by feeling secure in your marriage. So you got to go back and ask yourself, are you secure with your husband? Are you secure enough to tell him in full transparency, what's going on in your head, what's going on in your heart, what's going on around you. And if not, you, then you have to ask yourself, why, why do you not feel secure to talk about those things? Why do you not feel secure to be present and to be yourself and to show yourself, whether it's in front of your in-laws, in front of your children, in front of your spouse, church, people, friends, whatever, uh, coworkers, whatever. And so by being that person, by putting yourself out there, there's also the fear of, well, what if this husband no longer accepts me? What if this person no longer hears me? What if this person is unwilling to bend and to help me the way that I am called to help him? They get confused with that word, that submission part that, well, because I'm supposed to submit, then that means I'm supposed to keep quiet and be the helper. And I don't need, I, it doesn't matter. I don't matter. 
but you do matter. And if your husband loves you, then this, what you're, what's going on with you matters, you know? So it's an insecure thing and it's a, it's a taking up space thing. It's a communication thing. And it's you having the security in your marriage to know that regardless of how I feel and when I feel it, I'm going to be safe to say it and express it. And I'm going to be loved. I'm going to, I'm going to be received with loved, you know, by my husband and by the people in my family that I created or who's around me by the creation of this marriage. And so that's what I think it's a lot, which is why we're here as coaches. (laughs) We're here to help you through that, but it's a lot to unpack. And if you're, if you're not willing to start at the foundation, then everything else that you build on top of that is just going to get harder and heavier and, and, and more fragile. Yeah. But I think that's why loving yourself and being secure with yourself before you try to merge your life with another person is so important because I love my husband. Right. Mm -hmm. But I know that because I'm secure in myself and I love myself, I know God loves me. I know that I'm good regardless. Yeah. I know that if there were ever a situation where God forbid my husband decided that he didn't want to show love towards me or anything Mm -hmm. like that, I know that I would be good on my own. And because of that, there's a certain both boldness and vulnerability that I can come to him with things because I come from a place of God's got me no matter what. So I assume that he loves me. And when he, you know, when I come to him with something, he's going to respond from a place of love. If we have a disagreement about something or he does something that doesn't make me feel good, you know, when I come to him, he's going to be like, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. I didn't realize that you feel that way. Like my bad, we can work on this. But I also know because I have a strong foundation in both myself and in my faith that I'm good regardless. And that, that allows me to have those conversations in a much healthier way. Yes. It's, it's creating that blueprint, you know, it's creating the blueprint of this is what I am expecting to receive in a loving standpoint, because I do it to myself and I'm receiving it from God. And this is what I am expecting a healthy relationship to look like because I have one with myself. I have one with God, um, doing the work before you get married, doing the work before things get serious, having conversations on those early dates, you know, talking to your, to to your partner, talking to your boyfriend about their parents, about your parents, about people who are going to be living this life with you. Should you guys happen to get together? Um, those are all very important conversations to have because you could find out in those early stages of like, Oh, he, he doesn't have my back. He's a mama's boy. You know, he's never going to have my back. Why would I ever be your wife? If you're never going to have my back, like you could figure that out real quick if you do the work, if you plant the blueprint, if you, if you set the blueprint out and and replicate what you've already found to be successful and true and whole in yourself and in in that faith that you have, but a lot of people don't do that. They just want to, they, they rush into it and they think that it's good. And they don't, sometimes they don't even know what to ask or what conversations to have because they never had to deal with it until it's presented themselves, you know, my hu- my husband and I, before we got engaged, we read a book called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged, right? So we are like, okay, this sounds sounds pretty good. And this book, I, I kid you not, it, it brought up so many questions, things that were even on our radar, things that were never on our radar. What are you going to do to maintain the romance in your, in your marriage five years from now? What are you going to say to your husband to affirm him? Or what are some things that you could say to affirm your person? What about finances? What are you going to do when you guys have kids and their holiday seasons are coming? And we're just like, we're not even talking about kids, but to have that conversation that early in the relationship, let us know that we were on the same page with a lot of the things, or we either, we were either on the same page or we hashed it out. I mean, some things took us a solid week to be like, listen, I, we're not there yet. We gotta, we gotta go back to this, to this question because I, 
I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me. Like it led to some heat, but because we were able to iron it out, you know, without the distractions and without the commitments or without wedding planning going on when that happens, you know, you're able to come with a level head and say, we can work these out. We can address these problems. Now we know what to do if they ever arise in our marriage further down the line. And because of that book, we both knew without doubt that, yeah, I want to marry you. After all those questions, after hearing about your past, the skeletons in your closet, your traditions, your, your, your goals, the way you think, the way you process, the way you emotionalize everything. Um, after all that, hearing all of that, yes, the answer is still yes. Then you guys are good to go. You guys can get married and you sh- you're not to say that you're not going to have problems along the way, but it's going to prepare you for when those problems come. And it was great. Yeah. No, I will definitely link that book in the show notes. And Selena, if any woman listening wants to work with you, how would she do that? So I work with women of all relationship stages. I do one-on-one coaching. I do have a membership that I am building for single women. Eventually there will be one for married women, but for now I'm focusing on the single women and it is coming out later this year called single by faith. If you want more details, if you want early access to it, um, to help you grow your faith, to help you redesign what love looks like to them, to help you redirect yourself when next time you meet someone new or next time you go on a future date, you know, this is the membership that's going to give you the support and accountability for that. So hit me up for that. My name is very complicated. I understand this, but if you find it in the correct spelling, you will find me everywhere. My handles are all my name on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook. And uh, you could find me by searching Selena Almodovar. You could search my books. I have prayer journal books as well as Christian dating books. And I offer a lot of services to you guys if you're interested in learning how to grow and love by faith. So in the show notes, I will link both of our social media handles um, and both of us are at our names, which makes it a little bit easier if you get the spellings correct. Um, But but yes, take a screenshot of this episode, you know, put it in your stories on Instagram. Let us know what you think. Share your thoughts with us. You know, both of us would definitely be interested in knowing how you feel. And, you know, I just want to, leave with what I think we've been talking about this entire conversation is that at the end of the day it's just important that you know yourself know yourself know who you are know whose you are you know who you belong to Um, and understanding that understanding that you are fearfully and wonderfully made operating out of that will make all your other relationships so much better So thank you guys for listening. Um, Thank you again, Selena. And we will talk to you soon. Hey there. So you made it all the way to the end of the episode, which means I have two things to say. One, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. And two, you like me. You really like me. So I would appreciate it if you would show that like by subscribing to this podcast so that more people can hear about it and enjoy it as much as you do. And if you want to know more about any of the links that I mentioned on this episode or any guests that I've had, be sure to go to KeishaRice.com slash links. That's K-E-S-H-I-A-R-I-C-E dot com slash links. I can't wait to talk to you again in the next episode. So see you then.